Money is a new modern form of trading. Money is what you use to buy things. It doesn't have to be paper, it's just like anything. You can give them a turn for like a valuable. You can use like the physical representation to buy products. The money can't be easily counterfeited or duplicated so that there's some value to the money that people have in their hands. If we grow on trees, then everybody would be growing it and it would lose its value. It has to be accessible and convenient so that people can easily use their money. You can use money for gas, uh, buying a car, food, gum, anything you want. So what is money? That's a simple question, but the answer is a little more complicated. Economists say money is three things. It's a medium of exchange. In other words, you exchange it for goods or services. It's also a unit of account, meaning that you can measure what something is worth in dollars, at least in the US. In other countries, they use other forms of money. Finally, money is a store of value, meaning you can hold on to money and use it later. The more money holds its value, the more likely you'll be able to buy the same amount of goods and services with it later. For something to work well as money, it should have six characteristics. Money is divisible. After all, you have to be able to make change by dividing larger notes into smaller ones and into coins. It's portable. All modern money is easy to carry around. It's acceptable. Dollars are accepted as payment everywhere in the US and many other places too. It's scarce. The supply of money is determined by a central bank like the Fed, and that amount is less than what everyone wants. It's durable. Bills and coins can last for many months or even years before they are worn out and need to be replaced. And it's stable. Your dollar shouldn't gain or lose much value for a long time. Now, what gives money value? Simply that other people will accept it to pay for goods and services. Money could be backed by something people think has lasting value, like gold but that doesn't necessarily make it more valuable. U.S. currency isn't backed by gold or silver. It's backed by people's trust that it's worth something. And that trust is in large part based on the actions of the Federal Reserve. Oh boy, looks like rain. Sure could use an umbrella. Excuse me, sir. I already have a raincoat, so I'll trade you my umbrella. Have anything to barter for it? Yeah, um, how about this flashlight? Mm, no, I already have ten of those. Uh, oh, this is a really great pipe wrench. Sorry, the landlord does the repairs. Dictionary. I already read that. Barter can work but only when each participant is willing to trade what they have for what the other is offering. That's what economists call a coincidence of wants. It's not working now because she has no use for any of the items he's showing her. They don't have a coincidence of wants. I wouldn't want a flashlight either, or a pipe wrench, or binoculars. That's why barter is so difficult. Not to mention you have to physically haul the items to be traded to the other person. Instead of just carrying a few of these in your wallet. There's also another big problem with barter. What's that? It's difficult to know the price of different items. A pipe wrench could be worth an umbrella to one person, but two umbrellas to someone else. Hi, may I help you? Yeah, I'd like a slice of pizza. Um, that one. Sure, that'll be $2. There you go. Another advantage money has over barter is that it encourages specialization. Without money, running a successful business as specialized as a pizzeria would be difficult because the owner would have to accept the countless items her customers bring in to trade. Thanks to money, people can produce just one good or service and trade it for money. Then they can use that money to buy just the things they want from other people. What we call the money supply is the total amount of money available in the economy at any time. But economists calculate the money supply in different ways, depending on just how liquid, meaning how available to spend, it is. One way of calculating the money supply is called M1. M1 consists of cash held by the public, plus funds and accounts on which demand withdrawals can be made, plus traveler's checks. M2 is M1 
plus instruments and accounts that are slightly less liquid, including savings accounts, certificates of deposit, and money market mutual funds. How do banks make money? Commercial banks take customers' deposits, and they also make loans. They may pay interest on deposits, but they charge more interest on loans. They make money on the difference between these two rates. Suppose a bank charges 12% a year on a $1,000 loan, and pays 2% a year on a $1,000 deposit. At the end of a year, the borrower will have paid $120 interest, and the depositor will have earned $20 interest. From those two transactions, the bank will have made $100. That's the most basic way banks make money. Banks also make money by charging fees for banking services they provide to businesses and individuals, and by making investments in financial markets. When banks accept deposits, they can take most of that money, but not all of it, and lend it out. This can benefit everyone, depositors, lenders, and the bank. Let's see how it all works. Suppose a company deposits $10,000. If the regulations say the bank needs to keep only 10% in reserve, it can lend out $9,000. Why do banks need to keep some money in reserve? One reason is that if they loaned it all out, they wouldn't have any left for customers to withdraw. When banks keep only a fraction of their money in reserve, it's known as fractional reserve banking. So, getting back to the 9,000 the bank can lend, let's say it's used by another business to pay wages. Now the workers have the 9,000 among them. Let's assume they each decide to save all of their money in their bank. So, the 9,000 comes back into the banking system and it begins again. The bank keeps 10%, $900, in reserve and lends out another $8,100. This practice of lending everything but the reserves can keep going through many cycles before there's nothing more to lend. But what happens if everyone tries to withdraw their deposits from the bank at the same time? A bank run occurs. Since the bank has lent out the majority of the money its depositors put in their accounts, it won't be able to pay out in cash all the money that people might want to take out. But under normal circumstances, people keep their money in their accounts, and banks are able to predict how much they can lend out without causing them to run out of funds. Today, bank runs are usually headed off before they begin, by the action of the Federal Reserve through loans to banks, and the actions of other banking regulators, such as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. When banks make loans, it actually increases the money supply. How does that work? Well, the money supply is the total amount of money available in the economy at any time. Suppose a bank has $10,000 in deposits, and it lends out $9,000. That loan initially increases the money supply by $9,000. Now, if that $9,000 is deposited in another bank, and that bank keeps 10% in reserve, $8,100 could be loaned out. Repeating that cycle over and over again until there's nothing more to lend, it turns out that the original $9,000 loan can increase the money supply by a whopping $90,000. That's how money is created. The opposite is true, too. When people repay the loans, it shrinks the money supply. Here, when the first $9,000 is paid off, it reduces the money supply by $9,000. However, the bank will be quick to relend that money and return the money supply to its original size. In effect, money is being constantly created and destroyed and created again through banks' loan-making practices. The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the United States. But what does that mean? Well, a central bank provides financial services for both the government and depository institutions. By the way, 
most developed countries around the world have a central bank. A central bank, like the Fed, can perform many services, including influencing money and credit conditions, supervising and regulating financial institutions, keeping the financial system stable, distributing coin and currency, clearing electronic payments and checks, acting as a banker for commercial banks and other financial institutions, being the lender of last resort, and providing financial services to the government. A central bank influences the availability of money and credit. It does this through monetary policy. Monetary policy means actions that influence the supply of money and the availability of credit. In the United States, the Fed takes monetary policy actions to promote price stability and full employment. There's evidence that countries which have independent central banks, banks that are free from political influence, have lower inflation, and their economies are more stable and stronger. Also, independent central banks significantly reduce the possibility of political manipulation of the economy. The United States has had a central bank as far back as 1791. But there were times when we didn't have one. That led to problems like having no single currency that everyone could trust. You like the cow, eh? Cost you $10. Fair price. Five, six, seven. Wait, wait a minute. I've never seen those before. What bank are they from? They're from Stormy Ridge Bank, as you can see. Stormy Ridge Bank? I never heard of them. In periods when the U.S. didn't have a central bank, our economy was more vulnerable to cycles of booms and busts. Also, there was no lender of last resort. So, there were more bank runs and more banking panics. The Federal Reserve has been our central bank since 1913. While there have been financial ups and downs since then, the Fed has always aimed for a more stable, expanding economy. You can inflate a basketball with air, but in economics, inflation means a rise in the general price level of all the goods and services produced and sold in an economy. One of the causes of inflation can be too much spending chasing too few goods. In other words, the total demand for goods and services in the whole economy is greater than what the available resources can supply. Let's see how that works. And we have this great car that we're auctioning off today. These students are bidding on a car. Let's assume that car represents all the goods and services produced in the economy during the year. The bidders have different amounts to spend, up to a maximum of $10,000. So let's start out with a first bid of $1,000. Right there, I've got $1,000. How about $3,000? $3,000. How about $5,000? $5,000. $7,000? $7,000. $8,000. $8,000. $8,500, right? $8,500 with this guy going once, going twice. Aha. Uh -huh. This lucky bidder gets the car for $8,500. But what happens when the money supply is increased and the same people bid on a second car the next year? Same model, but the maximum any bidder has now is $25,000. You guys have the dough, you know, you got it going on. Who give me $5,000? $5,000? When the maximum possible bid is raised to $25,000, the car goes for? $21,000. $21,000. That's 147% inflation. Now remember, we assumed that the car represented all the goods and services produced in the economy in each year. So, the inflation was caused by an excessive increase in the money supply, coupled with no change in the amount of goods and services produced in the economy in each year. Another cause of inflation is called an inflation shock. In 1973, an oil embargo caused a dramatic rise in oil prices. Because so much of the economy depends on products made from oil, the result was higher inflation throughout the economy. There are several things that can lead to inflation in the short run, but long run, sustained inflation is caused by excessive growth in the money supply. In the 1970s, inflation shocks, such as the dramatic rise in oil prices, were coupled with excess growth in the money supply. Together, the inflation shocks and the overly accommodative monetary policy fueled inflation throughout the decade. This is why price stability is so important to the Federal Reserve, which can control the growth of the money supply in the United States.
Inflation occurs when the prices of goods and services across the economy go up. Deflation occurs when prices across the economy go down. Prices go down? Sounds like deflation is a great thing. I know lower prices sounds good, but deflation is usually a symptom of a down economy and has some pretty bad consequences. For instance, deflation happened during the Great Depression. There was less demand, so prices fell across the economy, businesses' inventories grew, people were laid off, unemployment rose, and incomes fell. Also, people waited to buy things because they expected prices to be even lower in the future. So firms produced even less and laid off more workers. The cycle continued. Since too much inflation is bad for the economy and deflation is also bad, one of the Fed's main goals is to keep inflation low and stable while avoiding deflation. A related term is disinflation. That means a slowing of the rate at which prices are increasing. In other words, a decrease in the inflation rate. It's not the same as deflation when prices are actually decreasing. For example, disinflation occurred from 1980 to 1983, when the inflation rate went from over 13% to under 4%. Inflation affects people differently. If you've taken out a loan, say to buy a home, at a fixed interest rate, inflation is good for you. That's because the dollars you pay back are worth less than when you borrowed them. But high inflation has mostly negative effects. It can lead to a decrease in what people can buy with their savings. People on fixed incomes can suffer because their incomes don't buy as much as they could before. Individuals and businesses will increase the time and money they expend trying to avoid the effects of the increase in prices. Workers may have problems paying their bills if their wages don't rise as fast as prices. And individuals and businesses may face challenges in drawing up contracts. Individual prices go up and down and that plays uh, an important allocative role in our society. But the general level of prices, whether the general level of prices is roughly stable or is rising at a very rapid rate. That's something that importantly affects the plans of savers as they try to plan for their retirement, affects what it means, how difficult it is, for example, to pay off a debt that a household or a business is undertaken. Having a predictable and low rate of inflation is important to making those financial decisions. Price stability is essential to having an economy that is able to grow. When you don't have price stability, and so when inflation begins to grow, people make different decisions about how they'll spend their money. Businesses will spend their time worrying about keeping their books up to rate with inflation and not conducting the businesses that they're supposed to conduct, creating the products and services that we value, that we buy and sell, and that we live by. The reaction that the Federal Reserve has to take if inflation gets high, and we saw periods of this back in the 70s, is to begin to raise interest rates in a way that has other adverse reactions to our economy. People lose their job, businesses pull back. And so we are very careful, given those experiences, to think about how to maintain uh, a more constant level of price stability in this country. In the 1970s and early 1980s, inflation was very high. So the Fed worked to decrease the growth of the money supply, tighten credit conditions, and raise interest rates to bring inflation down. But that brought on a short run rise in unemployment. That was painful, but necessary because continued price instability would have prevented the U.S. from achieving maximum sustainable economic growth and full employment in the long run. The Fed learned from this experience. Fed policymakers work hard to keep prices stable, taming inflation before it ramps up, while at the same time considering the Fed's other goal of maximum employment. Mm -hmm.